Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this McGraw-Hill Education webinar, Motivating Students to Stay in the Math Game, a Formula for Advancing Struggling Learners. I'm Doug Cavillage with McGraw-Hill Education, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. Uh, our webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear uh, the presenter, but due to the size today, she won't be able to hear you. However, that doesn't mean you can't participate. We, of course, want to hear any questions you have. Uh, so just type those in the questions panel on your toolbar, and we'll also be offering opportunities to interact through open response and several question polls throughout the webinar. Joining us today is Robin Silby. Uh, Robin Silby runs her own uh, business, Robin Silby Professional Development, where she motivates pre-K to 12 educators and students to value the power of mathematics. Robin, we're really excited to have you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here and delighted that so many of you uh, have decided to join me today. Um, my name is Robin Silby, and this is my 42nd year in the field of education, 11 years as a classroom teacher, and 31 and counting as a coach. I am the conceptualizer and author of the monthly feature that comes out in the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, a periodical for elementary folks called Teaching Children Mathematics. And that coach's corner is mine. Um, I, I hope you get a look at that feature the next time you see this journal. I'm also a co-author on McGraw-Hill MyMath, McGraw-Hill Glencoe Math, and I'm the contributor with Number Worlds, the intervention program. So I'm going to ask you to help me out today and, and interact with me, join me in the discussion about this. And the first thing I'd like you to do is to enter into the question box, please, I'm begging you, one word or a phrase that describes intervention in your classroom, school, or district. Please go ahead and enter some ideas into that question box. Let's get this conversation going. Excellent, I'm already seeing multi-level, good. Small group, great. Um, frantic, I saw. Productive. Tier two, excellent. And breaking things down in differentiated instruction. Successful, fun. I am so delighted, rigorous. I'm getting some absolutely wonderful responses here. I'm so thrilled with you guys. This is going to be a terrific session. Thank you so much. And differentiated instruction. I, and I see frustrated, so there's plenty of stuff. Let's go on. Beautiful. Today, our goals are to identify beliefs about learning, both negative and positive. Um, on the positive side, we're going to look at intrinsic motivation and growth mindset, things that I'm sure some of you, if not most of you, are familiar with. And then we're going to connect those positive feelings about learning with the Number Worlds Intervention Program. So let's swing into it. Here's your next opportunity. Uh, there's a poll there for you. And um, I'd like for you to um, select one of these three options about the negative beliefs about learning that we see around the country. So there are three here to choose from. One, students believe effort won't make any difference. Two, students have low frustration thresholds and fall behind. And three, they're just not feeling it when it comes to learning. So if you would be kind enough to go ahead and fill in that poll, that would be super. And I'd be happy to share the results. Right now, it looks like that the kids, uh, the, the popular one is that the kids have a low frustration threshold. But keep voting, I want to hear. I'll give it a moment. In the event that you can't see this, 55% of you are saying that students have a low frustration threshold. Um, actually, it's climbing even more. It's approaching 60% now. And I think that's true because they, um, kids that are struggling feel like they just can't do it and they quit too soon. And of course, that enters so much into the two topics that we're going to talk about today, which are intrinsic motivation and mindset. Beautiful. I'm so glad that uh, it turned out that that's the one, uh, because that speaks to what we're doing so clearly today. 
Our goal today is to develop those positive beliefs about learning. And we're going to be using these two vehicles or two mechanisms, strategies, intrinsic motivation, and mindset. The first one we're going to talk about is intrinsic motivation. And uh, the big bestseller that uh, applies to intrinsic motivation is Drive by Daniel Pink, uh, the subtitle being The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And Daniel Pink's book, if you haven't had an opportunity to read it, is a quick and easy and very stimulating read. He talks about extrinsic motivation and the, the carrot and stick principle, but then he gets into intrinsic motivation. And he says, you know, infants learn how to do all this wonderful stuff. By the time they come to school, they've learned how to crawl and walk and talk and feed themselves. So what happens? What happens to that excitement and motivation to learn? Well, the fact is, nothing happens. I, I would venture to say that if you give any teen or child or young adult or anybody for that matter a brand new phone and said to them, go ahead and take a you know, learn how to use this phone so that you can communicate with all your friends, what would happen? Well, they'd probably stay holed up in some room, um, learning it into the wee hours of the morning, like I did, until um, I was able to use the phone. So we have to harness some of that intrinsic motivation that is present in little kids learning how to, how to function in the world and the cell phone. Well, Daniel Pink finds that there are three elements of intrinsic motivation. The first one is autonomy. And we are looking at a bunch of different ways that kids eat, um, which reminds me of, of just a funny, quick story to tell you. My freshman year in college, all the girls on our floor in the dorm uh, decided to go out to dinner to one of the girls' favorite Chinese restaurants. And when the food came, she had all the utensils removed, and she asked um, to be replaced with chopsticks. And we said, Patty, that's impossible. None of us know how to use chopsticks. And she said, you know what? Any way you get it from the plate to your mouth is the right way. And when you think about it, that has a little bit to do with learning anything. So we want to give our kids some autonomy in the way they learn. Yes, we want to present them with um, effective and efficient algorithms and procedures and processes, but we want to leave the door open for invented algorithms and, and wonderful things that kids think on their own. The second element of intrinsic motivation is mastery. And if you take a look, um, beginning at the top, how we start with those training wheels, kind of a guided practice when you think about it. And then down on the bottom right, you see that, that there's a lot of falling down, a lot of mistakes going on when we take those training wheels off. But eventually, we persist and we wind up being able to figure out the balance in riding a bike. And the same is true in school. We may have to spend a little bit of time learning those processes, understanding them, and practicing them. But deep in our hearts, we know that we're going to be good at it. And one really great strategy I have found is to keep the papers from the first week of school, and then several weeks later, show that to the kids, the parts that they struggled with and the things they now find so simple, and build that confidence that, in fact, yes, they have mastered, they have, they have grown. They've gotten better and better every day and every week. The third element of intrinsic motivation is purpose. And that's where we work so hard to learn how to drive, to play a musical instrument, and of course to use a cell phone. Because we either need it for work, for play, or to get along and belong with other people. And in learning academics, it's no different. If you look at the, the, the person um, looking at his watch, yeah, we certainly do need to learn how to tell time, how to use money in the real world, how to use computers, and pretty much everything that we are teaching in mathematics is part of something that they need for functioning in the world around them. So we think about those three elements of intrinsic motivation, and Daniel Pink says, yeah, but you know, sometimes we do have to ask kids to do stuff that isn't so much fun, algorithmic, plain old algorithmic work. And Daniel Pink suggests two strategies for that. First, to explain why the work is necessary and to make it part of a larger, larger purpose. So if we're asking kids to memorize or to, to master those multiplication facts, 
we need to tell them how that's going to come in handy in their real lives and in the mathematics it follows. And I think personally, more importantly, if at all possible, let kids have a little bit of control, a little bit of autonomy about the way they have to learn those things. So um, letting them choose their own time limit or giving them a page of problems and telling them to choose one from column A and one from column B or to design their own their own project, whatever, but some ways of giving some kids the control. So I'd like just to give you seriously about 10 seconds just to reflect for a moment about some ways you could incorporate Daniel Pink's three elements of intrinsic motivation, autonomy, mastery, and purpose to drive the interest and motivation in learning the math that you're teaching kids. We're going to move on now to mindset, uh, which was um, which we associate Carol Dweck. She actually has a book out. It's still on the bestseller list, paperback. Um, mindset: How we can learn to fulfill our potential. Carol's work began in the 90s. She did six studies along with Muller at Columbia University. She's currently at Stanford. Um, and I just want to tell you real quickly about uh, about the studies that that were circulated in the late 90s. Muller and Dweck asked 412 fifth graders to complete a task. And at the end of the task, they told half of the group, wow, you must be really smart. You did great. You must be really smart. And the other half, they said, you did great. You must have tried very hard. Well, this, they gave the kids, the same children, a second group of tasks to do. And when they finished, they told all of the kids, you didn't do as well this time. Well, the kids that were told they were smart initially thought, I guess I'm not that smart. And the kids that tried, that were told they tried hard thought, I guess I didn't try hard enough. So when the third round of tasks came around, they told the students they could choose the level of difficulty of those tasks. Well, the kids that were initially told they were smart tended to go for the easier ones because they wanted to make sure they still felt smart. But the kids that were told that they worked hard tended to go for the more difficult ones, thinking that they wanted to challenge themselves and see if they tried really, really hard, if they could learn something new and do something. So the summary statement for that study, and it was circulated in Reuters in 1998, um, is this quick paragraph. So I would love for you to read that to yourselves. I don't think it's great to read to you. So please go ahead and read that to yourselves. As you can see, the first part, praising children's intelligence, really aligns with a fixed mindset, which we'll look at in the next slide. And the second one, when we ask kids to concentrate and strategize and think about what they're doing, that really aligns with the growth mindset. So that fixed mindset really aligns with the 20th century learning that certainly I was a victim of, where we were just told to do stuff, copy it down, practice it 50 times, and shove it down our throats, basically. And it reinforced and praised talent, but the talent was really about memorization and not the best. So the quote that comes with that is, I'm smart and I don't take risks, because if I make a mistake, I'm going to feel stupid. Well, that's been replaced for a good reason. If you look at the Washington Post magazine, August 11th, there was a headline there, want a job? Learn to do what a robot can. And what they're, what they're saying in this quote is that work that consists of following directions, like factory work, is really now being carried out by computers and people with very low wage jobs. If you want to earn a living and, and do a good job, you are going to need a deeper level of knowledge and understanding and the skills to apply it. Well, that feeds right into that 21st century growth set that we're really looking at. And that reinforces and praises effort and, and it expresses to our students that we work hard and we continue to improve and mistakes are simply markers on the road to success. Sure, we're going to fall off that but That's a good thing. How else are we going to develop the balance if we don't know what imbalance really is? 
So think for a second about how your students say a growth mindset is nurtured in your classroom. Our goal today is to engage, stimulate, motivate, and involve all of the students all of the time. It's a pretty lofty goal, actually, but we're going to use those two avenues of intrinsic motivation and mindset to think about how we could build those positive attitudes. And we're actually going to um, see how those ideas, intrinsic motivation and mindset, are embedded in number worlds. I took a look at just one single lesson, although it pictures, it illustrates all the lessons in the series. And that was level I in the middle school, solving two-step equations. So when we tell kids to find the math, and that's in every lesson, that really illustrates what Daniel Pink is calling the purpose. I really have to learn this. And when we think about solving two-step equations, we could ask kids what services or companies they can think of that charge a flat one-time fee and plus a, a per unit fee. So think about getting into a taxi cab, a flat fee for the first mile and then every sixth of a mile. Think about your cell phone plan. You've got a flat fee plus any minutes overage, God forbid, um, bowling shoe round plus the fee, for fee per game, lots of other ideas. And that's a great way to get kids to understand, yeah, I actually do use solving two-step equations in everyday life. When we get to the engage in that lesson, that's really all about the mastery. In this particular case, we ask kids to use a balance scale so that they can see that an, an equation is solved if the two sides are balanced and equal. That little tactile kinesthetic addition really helps kids get a firmer hold on the information. We also include progress monitoring in our lessons. And so we look at what the content of uh, what, what the common errors might be, and we think about that growth mindset. That if kids have difficulty understanding, then they can review the order of operations which they previously learned, and point out that those multi-step equations work in the opposite order. So, you know how order of operations has multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction. It's exactly the opposite when you are solving two-step equations. If we begin with the equation 2x plus 3 equals 11, the first thing we want to do is to subtract 3, exactly the opposite order of order of operations, and then the multiply and divide step. The reflect part of number worlds is all about autonomy and mastery, where you can assess your own understanding. So a critical thinking question targets conceptual understanding, and here's just one example. Could you multiply on by 2 on one side and divide by 2 on the other? Could you or not? Does that make sense? And we want kids, of course, to explain their reasoning. And then an informal assessment as well, which really targets that growth mindset. You can see what you can do and then figure out what you still need to learn. Well, today we spent a little time identifying those negative beliefs about learning, and we defined and explored strategies, including intrinsic motivation and mindset. And then we connected that with number worlds so that we could see how those ideas are embedded, and that number worlds is really all about that positive learning for kids. Our overarching ideas today are that students are motivated when they have understanding and control about what they learn, how they learn it and why they learn it. And the kids benefit from teachers' acknowledgement that mistakes are an integral and valuable part of learning. So here's my question for you. And I'm going to put up that second poll for you. Which one do you want to tackle first? I want you to complete the poll. One, take mathematics into students' worlds. Use progress monitoring to watch kids' steady growth. Use critical thinking questions to assess understanding. Embed autonomy, mastery, and purpose in students' work. Or celebrate success students' errors as learning opportunities. Please enter your ideas.
And the ones I see as the early leads in this horse race are it's a tie between four and five in betting autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and celebrating students' errors as, as um, learning opportunities. Followed closely by using progress monitoring. And I think that progress monitoring is a great idea. It really gives the teacher a lot of information. And it gives the kids information about their own learning as well. And I love that you guys have chosen four and five, which were um, the purpose of today's workshop, to really look a little bit more into intrinsic motivation and mindset. So now what I'd like to do is find out from you what questions you have, and I'm opening the questions there. If you would be kind enough just to type a question in, that would be just absolutely wonderful. One question uh, that I see right here is, um, what's the best way to begin? Well, in my opinion, one way to really achieve both the mindset and the intrinsic motivation is to invite kids to be eager participants in their own learning through discussion, discourse, that autonomy of letting kids um, think on their think by themselves and to share their thinking. That uh, standard for mathematical practice three, I think, really does align very beautifully with both of these ideas and with positive views of learning. And I have another question right here. How do you deal with students who are missing basics in so many areas? I'm trying to find this. Uh, in so many areas. Yeah, so um, kids that have trouble in a lot of different areas, I frankly think that we go back to where they feel successful as opposed, like if you've got a kid in 7th or 8th grade, they're not functioning in 7th or 8th grade. Rather than going back to six, it is my opinion that you go all the way back to first, second, third, see where they're on solid footing, and get that foundation concrete and 10 feet deep, and then find out where that first gap is, fill it, and then fill in all the gaps after that. You'd be surprised that once you reach all the way back, um, some of them tend to close automatically because once they see that one missing piece, they go, oh, okay, now all this other stuff makes sense. So that's what I would do. I would go back as far as you feel like you need to do, uh, as far as back as you need to go in order for the kid to feel successful, and then find out where that very first gap is. The next question, my students seem to work so slowly. I want to assess quickly. So I post progress monitor type tasks problems. Some are done. Others aren't even started. How can we align, oh, and others aren't even started. I think that is the end of that one. And um, so what you're saying is that kids have a completely different pace. That's important. The kids that finish and seem to be somewhat successful, we want to move them along, kind of graduate them to the next more difficult thing. And the kids that are, that are needing more time to process, I, I think your best sense is the right thing, which is to slow down, maybe break it down into smaller pieces, find out where they are successful again, and then add the complexity as you go along. These are wonderful questions, and I can't thank you enough for sending them in. Here's the next question. How can we align with core curriculum standards and continue to make math a life skill? Well, I think that the core curriculum standards do talk about life. I think they are completely embedded in problem solving and real life situations. So I see that as a natural alignment. Um, performance based tasks, having kids uh, simulating life and looking at um, what life looks like and the math that comes out of it. And that's really what project-based assessment is all about, um, presenting the kids with the project and finding out what math comes out of it, and then finding that math to work. Any other questions? 
if I haven't answered your question and um, I've, att I've attempted to, please re-ask it so that I am sure that I'm, I'm doing the best I can for you. Any other questions? I have one. How do we get students to, talk to to write down their mathematical solutions when they just want an instant answer? That is a great question and certainly worth waiting for. I just had this discussion with a mommy recently who really doesn't understand why we keep asking her, her kids to justify their thinking. Here's the answer I gave her. If you're in calculus or algebra 2 and there are 10 or 15 steps and we need to go back and be able to examine where we began, it's very difficult to go back 10 or 12 steps and examine it from the very beginning. But if we start way early and ask our kids to explain their thinking and, and develop that metacognition that is used so widely in, in ELA, kids, are, kids become accustomed to um, and comfortable with examining their thought processes, figuring out, well, this is what I did first. Does that make sense? Okay, then what was the next thing I did? Does that make sense? Does it align with the first thing? And so I think it's just a great idea to constantly ask kids to explain their thinking. And I know that they just say, well, my brain told me. But they have to come up with some verbal explanation and then be able to develop that in writing. And that just brings me to one more thing. A lot of times kids have a very hard time um, um, communicating their ideas in writing. So my fix for that is to ask kids to discuss it with a partner or in small groups first, and then sometimes even to debrief as a class so that there's an opportunity to collect ideas, to solidify their thinking, and by practicing it through voice, through verbal articulation, they're really much more able to communicate and write. The next question. What if our students, by the time we see them in middle school, without the process of justification being, being taught before? Absolutely. Then ask kids to start articulating their thinking and ideas with mathematics that isn't challenging with mathematics that is, comfort, that is comfortable to them. So in other words, isolate the variable. If we're asking kids to articulate their ideas in, in speech or in writing, and they act with, with current challenging math, that's two difficult new learning things that they simply can't do at one time. So let's, let's break it down. Ask them to do some not terribly challenging math, comfortable math, get some practice in verbal articulation, written communication, and then bump up the math to the on grade level. Excellent question, so glad you asked. I have a seventh grade math class with students that range in skill from fourth to ninth. Yeah, there's a range. Uh, I, I, I frankly think that that range, believe it or not, even in second grade, we have kids that can barely write numbers and other kids that are almost ready for algebra. And it's, it's, an, it's a huge problem that I would love to be able to address and tell you, snap your fingers, this is all fixed. It just doesn't work. But what I can say is that the more open-ended your questions are, the easier it is for kids to be able to fit into that. I'll give you a quick example. Instead of having kids solve a bunch of problems on perimeter or an area, you hand kids a piece of quadral group paper or just plain old group paper and you say, okay, I'd like you to draw a rectangle of your own dimensions. Tell the side length, tell the perimeter, tell the area. A kid that can only do three times four, that's what they're going to do. And a kid that can do 257 times 75 will. Kids like to work to the edges of their own intellectual boundaries. They want to feel very proud of themselves. They want to get to the edge of the cliff, but not fall off. So I think by offering kids an opportunity to choose their own parameters that gets at the autonomy that we want, the mastery that we want, um, it's just a great activity and leaves you getting a lot of getting a lot of information about where they really are. 
Next question. Is Number Worlds a program that can help special education students as well as general education students in a middle school level? I believe so. I believe that the strategies that are offered in Number Worlds are great prerequisite skill strategies, reinforcement strategies, and alternate instructional strategies that can be used in the classroom in a regular grade level class. Any other questions? I want to thank you so, I'm not finished, I still want you to type some in, but the questions that have come in so far have really been stellar and show that you're, you're truly thinking and interested, which makes me very happy. Robin, thanks so much. Uh, as Robin said, uh, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to type them in uh, as we go. But um, we're going to be uh, sending a follow-up email to everybody who attended today uh, a few days from now uh, with the recording uh, link to the presentation. So uh, you'll be able to have a chance to review that. And uh, I, just, I have a couple more slides. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, I wanted to close with this one. If you think you can catch the bus, you will run for it. If kids think that they're nowhere near that bus, they're just going to turn around and quit. But if they think they're just a few steps away and they can really catch that bus, they are going to sink their total effort into running at full speed and catching it. And our job as educators is to make those kids feel like each and every one of them can catch the bus. And the last thing I wanted to do was to give you my, my website, my email, and my cell phone number. And please feel free to follow up with me anytime with questions, comments, suggestions, concerns, anything at all. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, absolutely. Yeah, feel free to follow up with Robin and you'll get a follow-up from us with the recording and, and information there. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, feel free to enter them in. We're seeing a lot of thank you Robins come in, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks Robin. We really appreciate your time today. Great presentation. Thank you so much.